Hi, everybody. Welcome to Music Matters Podcast. And uh, today I have an awesome guest and actually a friend too, um, Richie Castellano, uh, guitarist, um, songwriter, now producer, uh, kind of wears a bunch of hats with Blue Oyster Cult. How are you doing, Richie? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on your show. You're welcome. I'm, I'm excited. We, we first met, uh, we were doing the Queen uh, Symphonic Spectacular Rock Show. Um, that was, I guess, now, what, three or four years ago? I don't know. It seems like a long time ago. <laughs> that, that's the best way to meet somebody, I think, is when you get thrown into the fire on a gig like that. Yeah, it's exactly. Like you shake hands, and then you have to play some really challenging music together under very stressful circumstances. That's yeah. the, that, that, that's how you really you really see someone at their best or worst. <laughs> exactly. And that's I mean that's the funny thing. Like the Queen stuff separates the men from the boys. We've all heard those tunes. But when you have to actually play them, it's like oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I think um, I, I met a bunch of musicians that I'm that I've become friends with from those gigs because it, it feels like you've been through battle together. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we love Richard too. The conductor is an awesome. Yeah, guy. absolutely. Um, so you're a Brooklyn boy, right? I was born in Brooklyn. I moved over when I was very little. So okay. I spent most of my uh, life growing up on Staten Island. Awesome. Yeah, that's. I mean, Staten Island's a cool place because you're like obviously you're in the city, but you're not right in the middle of everything. Yeah, it's like cool. I get I get to be in, I can get to Brooklyn in ten minutes, Manhattan in about twenty five minutes, but I can still have a, a place to park my car. It's nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like I love New York, but I'm like thinking like yeah, park trying to park and living yeah. on a day to day basis, especially in the winter time, would be pretty nuts. I, I can have grass and a driveway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, Staten Island's nice. Um, so. Tell, obviously, Blue Oyster Call, that's, we're going to get there in a minute, but um, tell me, how did you get started? You had a, your family were musicians, right? Yeah, I am a fifth generation musician. Awesome. Uh, and my family, uh, my, my dad is a phenomenal guitar player and singer. You know the band from the 70s, the Chambers Brothers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was their touring guitar player at one point. Wow, awesome. Yeah. He was the white guy. If you had trouble was, recognizing yeah, him, yeah, exactly. Okay, but, um, <laughs> I was yeah. Those Chamber Brothers. Okay, yeah. and, and um, uh, he also you know is a very uh is like an R and B blues singer and and great guitar player, great singer. Uh, and my uncle is a rock bass player. So oh, okay. I was constantly exposed to music. And, and but you know a lot of people say, oh, there was music around the house all the time, like. My dad didn't listen to music all the time. He played music all the time. Yeah, it was so, just the whole existence, right? Yeah, and and they didn't mind me as long as I was quiet, just to sort of because <laughs> they had they had like a wedding band, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I would be sitting in the corner while the, they were having rehearsal, and just I was watching my dad just the way he would interact with people because my father was the band leader, and it just taught me like, okay, here's how you treat people, you know what right. I mean? And how how he was like respectful of everybody, but he had to like there there has to be someone who's going to run the rehearsals. Yeah, you got to get the who, job done, right? Right. Some someone who also knows what everybody's strengths and weaknesses are, and and knows what to work on. So just like that was invaluable to me to just watch my father sort of uh, you know just run the band. And my father had great musicians in the band. In fact, um, uh, my father actually discovered Sharon Jones, oh, wow. the, the the singer. Right. And um, who who is no longer with us? Rest in peace. But mm -hmm. she was um, in my dad's band for decades. Wow. And, yeah, I mean, um, and that's that's a cool thing about New York too, because there's just those places like New York, Boston, the big cities like that. There's so many great players, right? Yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing about New York is, if you if you play in a wedding band, um, you're you're likely to get off the road touring musicians, right? Like us, or um, or Broadway musicians. Yeah. So, so you're getting like a band of killers. Yep. At you know playing a bar mitzvah or what? <laughs> exactly. and, and 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 people are just completely oblivious to yeah, it. Yeah, it's like LA. Like, the same oh, thing. Play that yeah. play that Black Eyed Peas song. It's like sure. okay, but it's like you know you, you realize you have people who could play with Chick Corea behind you if they had to. You know, um, but but that's that's the cool thing about it. And I'm sure it's like that. You know, in Vegas, I'm sure it's like that in LA. Uh, but it, it's nice to have access to that many people. And sure. You know, every, and uh, you know, people from Brooklyn and Manhattan, like you know, they know. Okay, I gotta get on a train. I gotta do a wedding tonight, or yeah, gotta, you know. Get, and that's, I mean, in, in New York, that's that's a great gig, right? I mean, you can definitely make a living just doing that. I, I mean, um, you, you know, know, my dad, you know, put a roof over our head with yeah. weddings, and um, and that's I the thing. When people it. people like they'll pick on wedding musicians or or that kind of thing, I'm like, no, you know what, man, it's it's like a great way to make a living. Um, and really, if you're doing something you love related to music, it's a win, right? 
Yeah, you know what? It's like anything else. It depends on who you're playing with. Because right. if you play with a band and, and everybody likes each other, you know. And, <laughs> that makes and, a big difference. <laughs> and, you, and you sort of like suffer through the whatever the latest pop song you have to learn is together. Yeah. And it's like a shared a shared misery. It's it's fun. It's actually fun, you know. Um, and also, it's you get treated well most of the time. You um, you get paid great, and you get to sleep in your own bed. Hey, so, and, free, and free free buffet food. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah. You, you, get, you get the flame and yawn sometimes. Exactly. The prime rib maybe. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big win. <laughs> so yeah, you did. I mean, I'm my sorry. my dad did it. And my uncle was in his band, and I think even my grandfather played weddings too. Oh wow. Um, yeah. So you know when people say oh. You know, oh, he's like a wedding band musician. I, I, I wear that as a badge of honor because that's how people support their families. Yeah, that's a that's a a great thing to be. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, like you know, being a professional musician is exactly that. Like you have been part of the deal is making a living, right? Paying your bills and yeah. And and one of the like I just did this. Um, I did this seminar a couple of years ago at Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. They brought me in as like a guest speaker, and I taught a guitar class of all like future. John Petrucci's and John Mayer's and right. uh and I told them I said if you want to work you're going to eventually play songs you hate so yeah. you better get you better get used to it and but then like I think when you get to the level that we're at like with just trying to do as much stuff as possible you don't really hate music anymore you're just like oh this is something different that I have to right. put, put another hat on for it's like something like you you might have hated as a kid like oh <laughs> I hate this band and someone says can you play this and you go yeah, yeah, I, I know that song. It, it stops. It, your your opinion matters less, and you, right. you're challenging yourself with the ability of being able to play the song. That's more important to you. Yeah, I went to uh, I went to Musicians Institute back in the '80s, actually, and we had Toto came in the band, the whole oh, band. Oh wow! And um, people were asking questions, and one of them asked Lukather, like, "What do you think about top forty bands?" He goes, well, "We're a top forty band." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like, if you're lucky enough to have a hit, I mean, you know, this if you're lucky enough to have a hit, you get to play it the next forty years, right? So, right. <laughs> that's you know, but you're didn't, making a living. So didn't Joe Walsh say? Um, about Rocky Mountain Way. If I knew this song was going to be a hit, I would have written a different song. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I used to play with the guy that did tequila, Danny Flores in LA. Oh, yeah. And that was the thing. It's like, you know, we're playing, we do these huge fair dates and we're playing tequila twice. <laughs> in the set. It's like, but you know, hey, people love the tune. So, yeah. um, so you did that. So you did the wedding thing. You did the obviously top 40 stuff. And, and I'm sure in New York and, and um, so, and, and you also study production yeah um, sound right and that's kind of mm -hmm. what brought you to um blue oyster cult yeah um so when i when it came time to go to college me and my father kind of butt heads a little bit because he thought that i should go in for performance right uh you know be a jazz major yeah that's and, tricky uh, right yeah and yeah. and i was thinking like I know how to play guitar. I, I really would like to learn about other instruments and learn about right. digital recording because at that point I had a reel-to-reel -reel 16 track that I recorded my first my first album on, and mm -hmm. I said, I you know this is something like guitar. At that point, you know I started playing weddings at 16, right. so it's like at that so point you're like a solid player by the time you're hitting 18, 19, right? What yeah, well what you know it was just it happened where my uncle. Um, at age 40, which is how old I am now, decided right. to get a real job and he started working for the post office and he oh, had okay. to go he had to go for training uh, he had to go cross country for training and um, he was gonna miss a bunch of dates mm -hmm. and so my uncle, who basically um, taught me everything I knew about bass, about recording, you know my, mm -hmm. my uncle's a genius the mentor and, and right. when my dad went to him saying, Who's gonna Who's gonna fill in for you? And he said, "Your son." And he was like, "Well, come on." And he said, "He could do it." So I went on a few gigs. I sort of like shadowed him on right. a few gigs, and uh, and <laughs> I, I just... took took notes <laughs> and I wrote stuff down and I and I did the gig. And then and then you know after that I was like, "All right, I can kind of do this." But uh, when it came time to go to college, I said, "Yeah, I I'm already playing gigs." Like doing that, I'm, and I'm playing, and no disrespect, but I'm I'm making more money than jazz musicians playing weddings. Why right. am I going to go study jazz? Yeah. So exactly. it just didn't make sense to me. Yeah. So I was like, let me learn about recording and production, and uh, I went to, per and we kind of butt heads, and my father insisted that I audition for jazz guitar and for um, production. Sure. So I kind of I so I would have both options. Yeah, both. Yeah. Luckily, I went to a 
purchased college in, in New York, and they were really cool about it because I said, you know, look, I want to learn about production and, and, and composition, but I also don't want to stop playing guitar. So they were mm -hmm. really cool about it. They said, oh, why don't you take some of these classes with some of the jazz guys? Right. So it was cool. Like, I'm not a jazz guitar player by any stretch of the imagination, but I got to play and learn about... Yeah, and you love, you love all styles. That's great to learn anyways, no yeah, matter what you're yeah. doing, right? So I got to learn more about, you know, music and my instrument through that. So I actually got a lot out of college, you know, awesome. other than just a piece of paper. Right. Yeah, it's tricky because, you know, the whole jazz thing. I mean, I, I write for Jazz in Europe magazine and and it's tough. I mean, even for major guys to make a living and, and you know, it's a little little scary. And like, I think you're like me, like, I just love music. I don't yeah, really I mean, differentiate between jazz and rock and pop and whatever. All, all my friends who are wonderful jazz musicians make their living playing R&B and pop. Yeah. Yep. So it's like, you know, it, it's the, the ability to do it. It's great. You know, it's um, one of my friends once said to me. He's like, you know, I don't want to be a jazz guitar player, but wouldn't it be great to be able to do that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, that's yeah, the, yeah it's because you, you know, you have that, we all have that thing in our head, like the Smoky <laughs> Jazz Club and, you know, Miles Davis and all that. You know, it's like, it's just like such a romantic thing, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so you're, yeah, so you're at Purchase, you're going to school, and then you get into sound um, production in general. Yeah. yeah. And how, how did the, the BOC connection happen for you? Well, it all depends on who you sleep with. No, I'm kidding. It's, uh, <laughs> exactly. It's, <laughs> well, thanks for being honest, Richie. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, I was I was studying, um, st you know, sound and and production, and I was doing sound for my dad's wedding band on weekends. <laughs> so I got demoted from the bass player to the sound guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, not a demotion. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, and we had a family friend who knew, I, who was sort of encouraging me to do this, who was also in the production field and knew I was studying it and right. knew I was able to mix live sound because mixing live sound and doing studio work are actually yeah, different. Different animal. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it, live sounds like combat mixing. <laughs> exactly. So the, uh, so he, he, wor he wrote for a bunch of audio publications at the time and he had to cover he was he was Blue Oyster Cult's front of house sound engineer, right? right? Which is at that point a big big deal, right? Yeah, and yeah. he had to cover the AES convention, right? And there was a some sort of lapse in communication where he told them, "I'm not going to be available on these two dates," and they said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah," and never got a sub. Oh, and okay. their their normal sub, who I believe was the guy who uh, was the guy who mixed Fog Hat. Oh, okay. He, um, so the the I should I should say names here. The um the guy who I was subbing for is my good friend Steve Lacera, who is now the band's tour manager and sound engineer, right? Oh great. Okay. Uh he's a wonderful person, great engineer. Uh and a family friend and he kind of took me under his wing. And so he's when when the band couldn't find a sub for him, he goes, "I know someone who'll do it, but don't be nervous, but it's a kid." Yeah, you know what I mean. And I was twenty at the time, so right. to them, that's that's a kid, that's a child. Sure. So, yeah. um, they were like, "All right, whatever." So I show up to the gig. And you know, I was gonna say, like, a lot of people get gigs that way, right? It's the last minute thing. You, the last yeah. minute phone call that you get sometimes is your best gig ever. <laughs> all the all the best opportunities I find are the ones where you just get thrown into it because. You know, the thing is, with, with this industry, it's all about recommendation and, and names. Yep. So it's like, oh, we have a vacancy in this slot. Let's get a name guy, right? Right, But sure. when it's – and so when people have time to mull over, uh, you know, yep. openings, they go, oh, let's try to get this name guy or this name guy, this guy with a certain – Or let's hold an audition or whatever right. too, right? Yeah. But when it's – when it's uh-oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like we have a gig tomorrow and some our, our name guy just dropped out. Right. That's when you can say, who do we know who can do this right now? And yeah. if you're if you're and I feel like everybody will eventually get an opportunity like that. And it's your job to be prepared for that opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. You, you prepare your whole life for that phone call. Right. Right. So um, I here I am with looking at the biggest console I've ever mixed on live. You know, my dad had, you know, a 24 channel. This is I think it was like 32 or 48 or something. Right. And I'm just going, oh, wow. And um, and this is I a look, world famous band that's yeah. at that time is just smoking hot like hits. And, and I'm and, looking yeah. at the most gigantic PA stacks I've ever mixed on. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. Oh wow, okay. Um, and 
I, on the way to the gig, I was talking to the tour manager and I said, hey, I, I studied the band's uh, records, you know? And he goes, great, do me a favor, forget everything you just heard. I said, what do you mean? He goes, the band's records, especially the early ones, have kind of like a lo-fi sound. He right. goes, we want big rock show. Make yeah. it big and mean sounding. That's awesome. I was like, okay. Yeah, as a 20-year-old sound guy, you're like, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I was repressed by all the uh, you know people's uncles and grandmas yep. at weddings saying, could right. you lower it, please? <laughs> hey, so, kid, can you turn it down? <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, big rock show. I, can do I think that. I made it painfully loud. I think I think it was <laughs> uncomfortable to listen to. Um, but awesome. I, I, I was having a good time, and I just turned around to look at the tour manager, and he was like, yeah, good. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. I, I, it was just it, – it was as loud as I can make it without anything feeding back. And right, it just yeah. – it, it, it felt like an assault. Yeah. And uh, then after the gig, I went – um, the drummer came up to me, and he said, are you the sound guy? I said, yeah. And the drummer at the time was Bobby Rondinelli. And I said, he said, I heard my drums bouncing off buildings in the distance. <laughs> yes. I said, I said, is that good? He goes, yes, that's good. <laughs> that's, a win. that's a big win for the drummer. So yeah, what, what an awesome opportunity at 20 years old. I mean, that's crazy, yeah, right? Yeah. And what happened is they, um, then from then on, I became the sub. Awesome. So anytime Steve Lacerra had to do something for his other job, for his writing gig, um, I would fill in for him. And for me, it was the greatest because it was like a little rock and roll vacation. I was young. I wasn't well-traveled. So right. I got to see all these new places and kind of go where they roll out the red carpet for you. Because right. as you and know- treated, it, treated like a like rock star royalty. Yeah, it's yeah. different traveling for a gig than going on vacation. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, like, have you ever had this experience? Like you go somewhere on a gig, right? And you go, oh my God. This place is so nice. I'm gonna come back here, right? And then you go back there, and you're like a schlub. Yeah. Like, why is it different? It's like, oh, because I'm not someone picking me up from the airport. Right. I'm not the one, you know, d doing this, paying for this. Yeah. It's like, oh no, I do everything myself. I'm just like a I'm like a punter now. Yeah. Where's my road manager? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a it's a very different experience uh, traveling on your own than with a, with a band. So and and also the, you know, the guys in the band, especially uh, Bobby Rondinelli, Danny Miranda. And uh, Buck Dharma, they immediately took a liking to me and kind of took me under their wing and and you know hazed me a little bit. It was yeah. it was it was great. All like, great players, yeah. I, I, yeah, I just loved it. And Bobby especially had just such a fantastic sense of humor. He's one of the most fun people to be around. What, um, what year? What year was this? Or this was years? 2000 that I started okay. doing this. Yeah, that's um, funny, man. 20 years ago, right? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, 20 years ago, and uh, the. Um, there was one opportunity that came up where there was a tour of Germany, a 13-city tour, 18 days. I've never left the country in my life. But right. as soon as I started working for the band, like when I was 20, I got my passport. I said, right. Smart. I'm probably gonna, I, I said, <laughs> I might need this. So I just got it. I had no yeah. plans on leaving. I, said, I just got it to have it. And that's something I tell musicians. I'm like, if you don't have a passport, get one because your best yeah. opportunity is going to involve a passport. <laughs> right. So yeah. I just – I said, I think I'm probably going to need this thing. And you know, I got I got the call again saying, "Hey, uh, next month, can you go to Germany?" Wow! And yeah. I, I said, "Yeah, I can go to Germany." I think my dad was nervous about it. He was like, "It's not a good time to leave the country." <laughs> you know, I was like, "It's," I was like, "I'm I'm going." I'm like, "I'm going." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, and it was on that tour that see, um, the the lead singer Eric Bloom, he um, because of my temporary status with the band as a sub, right. he never really bothered to become familiar with me because i was going to be gone the next week yeah and he's, and he's seen a million musicians and yeah and right it's like he's like you're just sure. another yeah. sub crew guy and that's that and i don't blame him right. um whereas the you know the other guys in the band were just you know like to play around with me a little more right mm -hmm. but now here i am on a three-week tour it's not just like oh i'm doing two dates over a weekend and then right. i disappear and you're so on the I'm bus on together in the tour, whole, yeah and and it's my first time ever on a sleeper tour bus and we get on the tour bus, and and I and Eric and I are just we're all looking at it, looking around, claiming our bunks, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and everybody tells me, "Don't get a bunk near the near the bathroom." I said, "Okay." So, <laughs> wise wise yeah, words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leave, leave that one open. That'll be the coat bunk. I was like, <laughs> exactly. "Okay." So um, you know, we're just and me and Eric go into the back lounge, and at the same time we go, "Oh, Xbox." And then we look at each other. You play Xbox, <laughs> you know. And then we started talking about like all the games we we're playing, and we said, "Oh, we're we just played all the same games." And I'm like, 
holy shit. And then we, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to curse on this, but uh, okay. he, he said, um, <laughs> and we, and we, uh, and we go, wow. And then, um, he goes, you know, I play computer games too. I'm like, me too. So he takes me up to his room. He's showing me his computer games that he's playing. And I'm like, oh no, you got to play the game that I'm playing, you know? And then <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And then like, we're on the bus and we're, you know, and we're starting to talk more. And he, and I said, Hey, I don't know if you're interested. Um, cause this was the week that two weeks before Lord of the Rings return of the King was coming out. Right. right? And so, by the way, just to mention you're a huge star Wars fan, but we'll get oh, yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I got it pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is the, the like two weeks leading up to the third Lord of the Rings movie. And I reached my bag. I said, hey, I don't know if you want to watch this. I, and I had the two like extended edition box sets for oh, Fellowship wow. and the Two Towers. And he goes, hold on a second. He reaches into his bag and he pulls the same two discs out. And I was That's like, funny. it was like that scene in Step Brothers. Did we just become best friends? You, yeah. You want to do karate in the basement? Yeah. <laughs> so, so like we were just like – because we never really got to know each other too much sure. because of my temporary yeah. status with the band. And, and it's um, kind of hard in this situation too, because like I said, you've seen a million guys come and go. And yeah, you, kinda, yeah, you get close yeah. to guys, then they leave and it kind of bumps you out. So yeah. Exactly. So during that trip, we, like me and him are, we're, we're talking and we're commiserating because my friends are emailing me that the pictures of their tickets from the midnight showing of Return of the King, the third Lord of the Rings movie. Right. And I'm going, these mother, you know, I'm like, I'm missing out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I showed Eric, look what these jerks are sending me. And we're talking about, yeah, I'd love to see that. But and meanwhile, you're on, tour, you're on tour with Blue Oyster Cult, so it's not, not, things aren't so bad. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's like nerd first. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, is. yeah, sure, but sure. The bus driver, the German bus driver overhears us talking about the, the movie. And then the next day we get into, I can't remember where, where, where we were, maybe Nuremberg or something. Um, the next day he goes, I, I have secured you two tickets to see Return of the King in an English speaking theater. And he hands us two tickets, two How tickets. Cool. And we, and, we, wow. and uh, we're like, whoa. So <laughs> while all the band is discovering local German culture right, and drinking this is on a day bar. off, right? <laughs> and they're all, oh, I'm going to go to this German market and I'm going to go buy this and buy souvenirs for my family. We're like, right. we're going to go see Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so we go, we go to this theater. There's like eight other people there. All Americans, yeah. Right? Um, and we see Lord of the Rings, and that was like our first like bonding experience. And the funniest story, and he tells the story better than me, but um, I get some candy for the movie, get some popcorn and some mm -hmm. Twizzlers or whatever, and a drink. And he looks at me. He looks over at me. He goes, "Listen, I don't want to hear any crinkling of the wrappers. <laughs> I don't want to hear any chewing of the popcorn. I don't want to hear any slurping." of the drink we are here to watch the movie this is not a buffet this is what he says to me right? <laughs> that's so funny jeez oh, okay so <laughs> like so he's, we're watching serious. The movie. he's serious we're watching the movie i put a piece of popcorn in, i'm just going <laughs> you know so You're like the world's gonna shatter a few yeah, years of right? <laughs> then all that's of a sudden funny. i think legolas uh, surfs off an elephant trunk and shoots an arrow. And Eric reaches over to me and goes, that was freaking awesome in the middle of the theater. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. So when we when we get home from tour, um, I was telling Eric about the video game. I play with my friends, and you mentioned Star Wars. And it was a game called Star Wars Galaxies, which is a multiplayer online game. My dad was playing it. My dad's a more hardcore gamer than me. Oh, okay. um, wow. All my buddies are playing it. And Eric gets a computer built just to play this game with us, right? <laughs> and we're all like, we're like all Star Wars people in a hunting party. And and um, I'm a lizard guy, and Eric's a Wookie, and my friend's a <laughs> bounty hunter, and this and it's like all the my other guy is an Ewok, and we're all we're having a, we're having a hunting party, and we're and we're all around the campfire, and my dad's there too, and and, and this is inside a game. We're we're talking through chat bubbles. Right. Yeah. You know, this is before the the team speak uh, voice voice stuff. So yeah. we're talking through like comic book chat bubbles, and um, and in the game, I, I, if I remember this correctly, I'm, I might be fudging this a little bit or making it better than it actually was. But the way I remember it is, <laughs> in in the game, I said my lizard man said, "Hey Eric, you want to come see my band this week? We're doing all of the Beatles' Rubber Soul," mm -hmm. and he goes, "Sure." You know what time? And and this happened like around a campfire, you know, uh, you know, in uh, in Endor, wherever uh, you are, yeah, in Star Wars, <laughs> somewhere in space, right? So 
He showed up to my my local band's gig because Eric Eric and I are both Beatles fanatics. Awesome. So um, he shows up and he sits in with us and he sees me play guitar. He sees me play bass. Right. Then two weeks later, the uh, there was a situation where the bass player at the time, Danny, who we both right. know, Danny um, he uh, he got the call to go play with Queen. Which that's a that's a really good gig. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's not really a gig you turned down. <laughs> yeah, you, you take that gig. Yeah. So um then here's BOC without a bass player. Right. And again, the situation where, oh, we, we can't get a name guy. You know what I mean? Right. So let's get so who's the last person I saw play? And Eric and Eric and Eric said, wait a minute, I just saw Richie. And then Steve Lacerra, the sound engineer, said, Yes, you should get Richie, he can totally do it. Wow. So, awesome. You know, I, I, Eric calls me up. I'm at home. I'm sleeping. I'm living in my parents' house, um, and you know, asks me if I can do the gig, the gigs on the weekend. And I, he gives me a list of like 22 songs, and you know, I, I, I lots of I, classic I, songs. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I shed my butt off like we do when we get situations like uh, you know opportunities like this. Sure. And my first gig was at a. Um, it was in Las Vegas. Um, at the Boulder Station. Oh, okay. Uh, is that still open, the Boulder Station? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, it was where the ba- the hardcore fans of the band had their, like, unofficial meetup. Yeah, and that's a great venue because it's it's big enough, but it's also yeah. intimate. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so so all the, the, like, hardest of the hardcore fans bought plane tickets to come have, like, a little And they're know, all sitting there staring at you, right? At my first gig. <laughs> <laughs> but the, no pressure. The, one of the coolest stories about that was actually the day before, because we had a gig that was canceled due to a storm. So we're just sitting in the hotel rooms. We haven't rehearsed. So yeah. we go into Buck Dharma's hotel room, and Buck has this little Martin backpacker guitar that looks like a boat oar. Right, yeah. Um, Bobby Rondinelli had his sticks playing on an office chair. Eric and Alan were you know, air guitaring and air keyboarding their parts yeah. and singing them. And I, I'm like, um, I'm the adapter King. I don't know. What, I don't know what your travel bag is like. This is a, this, yeah. is, this is a, this could be an episode on its own. Like what's in your, your no, gig I'm the bag. Same way. Yeah. I'm the same you're, way. <laughs> you're like, I, I have, I have an obscene amount of adapters that I yeah, always carry. As with. we learn, you never know what you're going to need when you're on the road. <laughs> right. So I, I've just always been this way. So I plug my base into the television <laughs> which I broke, one. you know, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I blew that television up, but yeah. so we played all 22 songs, um, right. like that right. and rehearsed it. And I got through the whole set and, um, I didn't make any mistakes. And, uh, then the next night I played the first gig. It was great. But th- then there was like this period wh- where weeks and weeks would go by and they were talking about getting the name guy. Right. So yeah. like, oh, you know, we got to get, we got to get Casim Sultan in the band. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. We got to get Casim Sultan. Reach out to Casim Sultan, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute, hey, wait what a about minute. me? But you know, I, so, <laughs> I, I, but they they made it clear to me that I was their temporary replacement. So yeah. after every weekend's worth of gigs, they'd be like, hey, can you next weekend? Okay. Yeah. Hey, can you do next weekend? Hey, and this you know, from- that's, that's an interesting thing because, like, that's happened to me a bunch of times. That's happened right. to a lot of guys. Um, that's how I got into Cirque du Soleil. I came in and originally just came in to do a week. They were gonna, The bass player who was a conductor at Mystere here in Vegas um, was going to train another assistant conductor. And I'm like – and I was with Gary Puckett at the time. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I wasn't – Cirque du Soleil was not on my radar at all. <laughs> not even close. Right. But, uh, yeah, I just – same thing. Like, I just – worked my ass off and, and like learn the tunes and and uh and then i ended up coming back like two months later but that's some of the best gigs that's exactly how that happens right right but the, you know after like weeks and weeks of hey can you do next weekend can you do yeah. next weekend i kind of like cornered the the principal members of the band i said would you like me to join this band <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, i remember exactly. this vividly because it was like outside of a rehearsal studio in, in manhattan and and Buck said, "Would you like to join the band?" I said, "Yes, I would very much like to join the band." <laughs> and uh, and that was it. And yeah. um, that's awesome. I haven't screwed up enough yet to be fired. So you but so you started on bass, and how did and then you end up switching to guitar, right? Yeah, well, guitar uh, keys, vocals, yes. the whole thing. Yeah. And I I I love playing bass. I mean, my uh, uncle's a bass player. 
My grandfather was a bass player. In fact, I have his upright bass pl- bass upstairs that he used oh. to do wedding gigs on. I have How it. How awesome. That's awesome. So um, I love playing bass, but, um, you know, guitar is my primary instrument. Right. So, and, and keyboards is, key, keyboard is not my primary instrument at all. Yeah. But what happened but is. But it's nice. That's a great double, though, right, to have. Yeah, you know, yeah. Cover parts and, yeah. What happened is um, the founding member, Alan Lanier, who was the band's keyboard player and guitar player, he retired. Okay. And um, they the band had a, a, a dilemma now because now it's not just that you replace – like I, I replaced Danny, who was like the fourth or third or fourth bass player to be in the band. Yeah, and I actually would encourage people to, to check out Danny Miranda because Danny's – a great player. He's played with a lot of awesome oh, yeah. people. Oh, just he's to a mention, phenomenal that, bass player. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so now I'm in the position. I wasn't like Danny was the third. I think the third or fourth bass player. Third, I think, to be in Blue Oyster Cult. Hmm. Um, this is me replacing a founding member. This is a tough sell. Yeah, you know it's a different. I mean? And all well, the all hardcore they were gonna fans. Get, they were going to get a new guy to replace the founding member, which was a right. tough sell. So they yeah. knew that I played other instruments, and they said, "Hey." Wh- Instead of getting trying to find a guy who can double piano and guitar, why mm-hmm. don't you do that? And we'll just get it'll be easier to get a new bass player. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> they said you play keyboard, right? I said yeah, sure. I mean, I really didn't, but <laughs> you know, it's like but you make it work, right? <laughs> yeah. My, my, my uncle, my uncle told me my, my uncle, aside from being a musician, was also an actor who has been in a few movies, like he was in Goodfellas oh, and stuff huh. like that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, um, What's his name? Me, Phil Castellano. Okay, cool. And he told me that you know when you when you and all the extras are lined up in the room and the the you know the assistant director or assistant producer comes in and says which one of you knows how to you know ski? Yeah. He yeah. said, ride, ride you raise horse. your hand <laughs> even if you've never skied before in your life. Yep, exactly. Because you get there, you figure it out. Yep, that's it. He said, you you, you always you always say yes, I can. That's that's the, just like the book. Yeah, but, uh, get the get the gig and then figure yeah. it out. <laughs> then sweat. So I said, "Oh yeah, exactly. of course." And then the next two weeks, I spent with a metronome and a keyboard. Yeah, you know, just learning the stuff. And but this was a different situation because now that I'm in, I was in the band for a couple of years. I, w- I was able to tell them, "Okay, I'm fine. Let's not do this song and this song for a couple of weeks." You know right. what I mean? Like, I'll get yeah. it. But because the thing uh, is, with the, with those guys with Blue Oyster Cult, I mean, obviously there's a lot of classic tunes, and there's there's stuff that's not easy to play, right? Even no, bass, guitar, not, no matter what. Yeah. It's deceptively hard because yeah. it sounds simple. And we've all heard those songs so many times, like, oh, I know that song. <laughs> Until right. you actually have to play it, right? It's it's I, I've seen, you know, a lot of people just uh kamikaze blue oyster cult covers. It's right. tough. Yeah. So um yeah, I moved over to that and then we had like a sort of a revolving door of va- bass players for a while. But I got to um the first bass player we got, Danny came back for a little bit to to fill in in between Queen. And meatloaf, right? So he yeah. he um he helped us out, but then uh, we got Rudy Sarzo. Yeah, Rudy. Who, by the way, well, I can't announce it, but <laughs> okay, I, he's going to uh, be a big of appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. Rudy, um, meeting Rudy changed the trajectory of my life because mm-hmm. Rudy Rudy was I was only in the band with Rudy for a short period, but he was very kind to me and a mentor in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, basically. Yeah, he's Rudy, a legend. I mean. Yeah, but I'm not even talking about the bass stuff. Obviously, he's a right. killer musician. You know what I mean? But yeah, as a person, sure. As a person, like, when everybody else is playing video games or, or you know, just messing around their phones, Rudy would be watching tutorials, teaching himself new skills. Interesting. Like, I never met, like, a hyper-motivated person like that. Right. You know, they exist. Like when you talk about all these, you know, billionaires that wake up at four in the morning and work out and then, you know, d- you know, do this and right. do that, like very disciplined people. Like Rudy is one of those super disciplined, you know, hyper motivated people. And and I, I I took an interest in what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And uh he and he saw that I was interested and he was learning three D animation and he was learning video editing and he was doing all this stuff. Um, as just a hobby, right? You know? Just to learn um, to be. He likes to learn. Yeah. It's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and like you know, for example, he was also with Dio at the time. He was splitting right. his time between Dio and us. And Dio had the like on the jumbotron had all these like animations of dragons and stuff. Mm-hmm. And Rudy made all of them. 
Oh, that's interesting. So that was really cool. Oh. And, you know, Rudy said to me the sentence that changed my life. He said, um, what's on your YouTube channel? I said, no. I have a couple of gigs from my old cover band. He said, you're making a big mistake. He said, if you don't have a YouTube channel, you don't exist. Yeah. He, says, a guy, he says, a guy like me, I don't need a YouTube channel. He goes, a guy your age, you need a YouTube channel. And he goes, and you need to treat it seriously. That's, that's what he said that, to me. That's so interesting, yeah, at that point in his career, too, to, to give you that advice, which is actually completely true, right? He's like, he's like Yoda. Yeah. He's like a tall, really handsome Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> damn, you're so damn look good looking at that guy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I know. Funny. It's. I'll tell you, Rudy. I'll tell you a quick Rudy Sarzo story. We had a gig where the flight was horribly delayed. Uh, none of our gear made the connection, and we had to get escorted by the local police from the. It was in Elmira, New York. We they had to drive us. They drove like 110 miles an hour down the road, right, right. Uh, to get us to the gig on time, right. So we so. It was the day, like, all of us are wearing, like, jeans and T-shirts, but Rudy decided to wear cargo shorts and a T-shirt, right? <laughs> so Rudy was not stage ready, yeah. you know? <clears throat> and uh, so Rudy is flipping out. He's going, like, I can't believe I look like this and I have to go play a show. He goes, this is the last time I ever wear shorts on a plane. I thought it was going to be comfortable, but I look, I look like a bum, you know, <laughs> and I'm going to have to play a show like this. So, like, we're just you're so used to Rudy looking better than all of us that it was funny because Rudy's like, you know, his hair is messed up. <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's not. We didn't have time to go to the hotel, take showers. Yeah, you just gotta make we, it work. We look like crap, right? But Rudy's wearing cargo shorts. He looks like he's shopping at Walmart, right? <clears throat> so I'm looking over at Rudy, like, oh, look at Rudy. You know, for once he he's down to our level, right? And then Rudy looks at all of us. <laughs> he takes his shirt off. He looks like a Greek god. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, then, we, then, then we immediately go back to schlub level. Like schlub level. <laughs> head to him again. So that's my that's my pointless Rudy Sarzo story. Oh, fun. But but um, yeah. So he he taught me a few things. He also like, I would do like goofy projects for fun. Like I would, I I did a series of like, comedy kung fu movies that I did with my friends, and uh, and the reason I bring this up is because I learned all the skills I ended up using later on in life from doing those. Right. And Rudy hooked me up with Sony uh, editing software. Okay. Rudy, like, we'd be sitting in an airport, and it'd be, Rudy, how do I chop this guy's head off? And he'd be like, and he'd be on his laptop looking over his shoulder, open up a new layer. Okay, um, duplicate that. Okay, um, add blood spatter. Okay, animate that. Okay, no, roll it. No, roll it the other way. And he would, and it's like he wow. just knew everything. Yeah. And, you know, or, or I'd go to his hotel room, and he'd, like, give me a tutorial on how to do video editing like that's so he taught, interesting yeah. he taught me everything it right. was unbelievable and to him like he doesn't even remember it yeah it, he's just a nice guy and to him yeah. he was just like oh it was like a, a thing in passing but to me it was so important you know what i mean right. like, like i can't believe first of all i can't believe i'm getting this information from a guy i used to watch on mtv Right, playing with Ozzy and <laughs> yeah, it, it was like it's total, total like mind bender. And that's a good lesson because you know you never know what pe I mean. People see it, musicians; they see people doing that thing, but they're like, you know, ideally, like they're full, well-rounded people. They do lots of other things. I mean, oh, that's yeah. I mean, with you too, with with your Band Geek series, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, that's like, but it's good to know that, right? Like, and yeah, I, this is, but this is what got me into all that stuff. Is is yeah. Rudy just uh, telling me the importance of of doing, you know, YouTube videos and producing right. my own content. It, it was, you know, because I was all about just being in Blue Oyster Cult at the time. Yeah. And he was looking ahead of that. He said, right. this is great that you're doing this, but you have to, you need to do something else. Yeah. So, and like, you know, the thing is too, is you can't just do music all the time. You have to have other things. Yeah. If it's related to music, it's just something different. I mean, I do photography. I do a bunch of other stuff. Right. But how much does photography help your music? It, you know, it all works together. It right? does. I mean, it, it's all creative and it all, you know, you meet new people and then you get new energy for stuff. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to jump because we're going to, we got a little bit of uh, limited time, but um, I want to talk about the new record. With, sure. Uh, Blue Oyster Cult because that, I just listened to the whole thing last night. Um, and what a great, just a great to, or the, I mean, the, the whole record's great. Um, you're actually a new, in a new role in this situation because you're actually songwriting, you're producing. Yeah. Um, and tell us a little bit about how the record came about, how that all happened for you, um, and that new role, I guess. So the this was the carrot that was dangled in front of me for the last 
15, 16 years. You know, my, my first gig with the band, they said, oh, great, you can write, too. So when we do records. Yeah. But so... I should say that the name of the record is The Symbol Remains, correct? Yes, The Symbol yeah. Remains. Thank you. Yeah. You're, you're better at this than I am. Uh, <laughs> I've got notes. <laughs> the, the, so every couple of years since I've been in the band, there would be a rumbling about a record deal. Right. And me being the person who got the passport early, who learns the songs early, who does all the stuff early, I'd start writing songs. Every time yeah. there was a rumor, I'd say, oh, okay. You know, let me yeah. write a song. And sure. I'd present it to the band, and they'd be like, eh, it's not happening. And then this would this would go on every two or three years. We'd get uh, there'd be an offer, yeah. it would fall through, deal would fall through. But every how time, is, that, and how was Buck on with that whole situation about doing a new album at that point? Is he just kind of like, eh, I don't know, or no? Was, Buck was really feeling? wanted to record, and for the last you know fifteen, sixteen years, when he and I would be in in the car driving to gigs together mm-hmm. on long trips, we'd be talking about how we would do it. Oh, okay. Like, he was really like we we were like so the seed was there. It's just yeah, we've been thinking happen. about it for a while how to how to finish it. Sure. Um, but it just ne- it, the opportunity never came just because we're not a band that lives within you know an hour of each other. We yeah. have guys who live in different parts of the country. So uh, flights it's, and hotels. Yeah, it's, need it's to, complicated, right? Yeah. Flights, hotels need to be booked. Recording time, studio time, needs rehearsal time. All the right. stuff needs to be paid for. And if yeah. there's no budget for it, the money can't just come out of thin air. And you want to do right? it right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. And also, like, it, we need to take time off of touring. So everybody's got to be compensated because it's not like we're not a band that meets up after work. This is our work. Yeah. So it's like you, that. It's it's taking a loss for a year, really. Sure. Um. So by the time we actually had a real deal, I had a bunch of songs written, and some of and basically I also was writing songs for myself, not just for the band. Sure. I'm I, I write songs. It's like part of what I do. Yeah. And um. I was just really hoping. I said, wouldn't it be great if I got to write one song on this album? I right. said, just one. It would be so cool. And and I told the guys, like, oh, you know, if you'd like to hear some of my songs, I threw everything I had in a Dropbox folder. And I sent it to everybody. I said, you yeah. know, guys, pick just whatever you like. Out. Sure. If you, if you want to change stuff, change stuff. Go write, go, you know, the, here's, here's what I got. Hmm. And... You know, early on, it was like, all right, you know, we'll check it out. And I wasn't expecting much. I, I wasn't expect. I was expecting it to be kind of the way the live shows are, where you know, yeah. maybe I get get a solo once or twice, uh, and maybe I have like one little spot. Yeah. You know, that's what I was expecting because that's how we've been operating. But as the process went on, you know, uh, during the year we were working on it, the guys kept going back to my Dropbox folder more. It's oh. like, well, what about this? Well, cool. what if we do this like this? You right. know what I mean? Or what if we add this section to this? And 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 just kept sort of picking picking out at it more. And um, then uh, other collaborations happened. Like uh, Eric w- uh, would get lyrics from uh, John Shirley, who's a song a song a ly- lyricist. Right. And John Eric Shirley would... actually wrote lyrics for a lot of the classic. Yes. Yes. Uh, Boc tunes, right? Mm-hmm. And um, especially in the last few albums. Yeah. Uh, and. Eric came over here, or Eric would say, I have a lyric that I wrote, and he and I would just finish those ideas here mm-hmm. together. So we had the songs in the Dropbox with the finished songs. Buck had a bunch of songs. Okay. Uh, our drummer, Jules, Jules yeah. Rodino, phenomenal drummer. Great he player. Had, yep. Yes, he had he had a song too. So everybody starts throwing stuff into the pot, and it was really fun. Um, and uh, and I at one point, I got a lyric. I got an email from... Uh, I was talking to... Our manager, Steve, and and I, and I was talking about like I said, you know, lyrics are going to become a stumbling block for us because mm-hmm. you know I'm um, I'm doing my best here, but like it would be helpful to have some lyrics that from like classic POC lyrics, right? And, and he goes, well, I can call Richard Meltzer, who wrote the lyrics for "Burning for You," "Harvest okay. of Eyes," like wow. a lot of the great songs yeah because that i mean the thing about that is writing a new album first of all it hasn't been out in, in 20 years right a new mm-hmm. a new art and then the other thing is you're you're all going up against classic huge radio songs oh yeah yeah <laughs> so it's like that's a little bit of a, a stressful thing right so we so um richard sent our manager a, a few lyrics and um i asked you know is any and anybody want this one and Buck was working on a different song, and Eric wasn't interested in it, so I just sort of took it and I, I wrote a song around it called uh, "The Return of Saint Cecilia," and um, that ended up on the record. And it was one of those things like, 
I, I wrote it for Eric to sing. You know, I said, oh, Eric should sing this song. It's going to be cool. Yeah. And then you know this. When you write and record music, you kind of fall in love with the demo right. a lot of the times. Yeah. So on the demo, I'm singing all these songs. So, you know, they would hear me sing it, and then Eric would just be like, nah, you sing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm like, me? Like, I wasn't expecting to, to sing anything. Wow, you're you're a great singer. I appreciate that. Yeah. But, like, you know, the, the two principal members of the band are the sure. singers. Yeah. So I was, wasn't expecting it. And then, you know, Eric started writing a song called tainted blood and we and we finished it here uh we 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 finished it together and and eric was going to sing it and eric said okay you know and then while we were apart we would we would make like notes on the demo and he'd say oh change this chord here shorten this section this is too dramatic you know change this and make a new demo of it so i'd make i'd make demos and on all the demos i'd be singing it sure and then the guys would be like why don't you just sing this too yeah, you know, and it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, and and then and then there were songs like there was a song I wrote called "The Machine." That's a song yeah. that I actually wrote. It was just a song I wrote, and um, the plan was that uh, Buck was going to sing it. Hmm. You know, because uh, Buck really liked the song. He said, yeah. "Oh, that's got to be on the album." And um, but you know, it just again, it worked out. Ah, eh, you know what, you do it. That's funny. Uh, but then yeah, how, how awesome is that? But those two guys were legends. That yeah, been around forever. Like that, they are willing to hand that off to you. They that's, were that's very so awesome. encouraging to me, and I'm honored to do it. I was shocked, to be honest, because uh, I I was singing all these things, like trying to, like keep. Yeah, you're mind, focused. Okay. You're focused on the song, right? Yeah, like I'm yeah. not going to sing this. That's okay. Let's just get this right. done. Yeah. You know. Um. But but then there were other. There was there was the opposite. Like um, there were a couple songs I wrote. Like one was called Edge of the World, and this was something that I wanted Eric to sing. And Eric's like, I don't know if I could sing this song. I said, you can totally sing this song. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and he ended up crushing it. You know yeah. what I mean? He's got but, a great voice. Yeah, but he was just like, he was, the thing is like, what what was what ended up being helpful in the vocal tracking sessions was when he was just like, not able to kind of get into it, I was like, you know that, just from playing the whole band's catalog, I was like, you know the kind of voice you did on this song? Yeah. I was like, try that on this. You know, and he'd be like, oh, all right. And and we kept like experimenting, like yeah. sing it like this person, or sing it right. like this person, you know, yeah. or just or, like, to kind of knock him out of his box a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I was like, you know what you did on Summer of Love, like that deep thing. Try that, try that for this line, yeah. you know. And it, yeah, it kind of got him out of the the just the mode of singing that he's used to, right. and right. and got some different sounds. So that was really cool. And then there was another song that I wrote called The Alchemist, uh, which. You know, he listened to it and was just like, "Oh God, I have to sing this." I said, "Because it's it's long and it's difficult." You know what I mean? Right. And I'm like, y- "You can totally do this." And he, that he un- knocked that out of the park. You know, like Eric, I gotta say, Eric worked unbelievably hard in this album. He was yeah. just so motivated. And it, the weirdness behind it is because we did the basics before COVID, but the overdubs were done during COVID. Oh, and right. The three of us. You know, me, Don, and uh, Buck, excuse me, B, Buck, and uh, Eric all live in different parts of the country. Sure. So we we recorded the album the same way you and I are speaking right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and, sort of the modern way to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, every day Eric would call me. Like, he was he was hyper-focused on this. Every awesome. day he's like, all right, 3 o'clock, we're going to You know what's, do this. What's, what's really cool about that, too, and I can tell that with, with, with Buck also, is that those guys still enjoy what they do. Because, oh, yeah. like, there's a lot of guys that have been around for that many years. They have the big hits. They just, they're kind of just doing it. But you well, can tell that those guys, they love what they do still, which is awesome. Well, you know? G- Buck, for example, like, he would do is he would, like, there'd be a song I wrote, I wrote and I would just be, like, lost in it. And you usually would be kind of like working on our own things, but sure. he would send me a track. He said, put this into your song. And it would be this, like, atmosphery synth part that I wouldn't even have considered. And yeah. I was like, Oh my God, that's so. And there's better. a lot of that in the Blue Oyster Cult stuff. Yeah, right? like just stuff was, out of nowhere. Know, that's like cool, really cool. Yeah, stuff. he would. He he was responsible for a lot of those little details of mm-hmm. adding it. And that's the other thing. It's it was truly produced by the three of us. Like there was nobody really saying this is how it has to be. You right. know, I would write a song, and Eric would be like, "You should take that first chorus out." And I'd be like, "Really?" He's like, "You should try it." And I would, and yeah. I did it, and I went, "Oh my God, that's better." Yeah. You know, because what ends up happening is we you get so caught up in the song you're working on, yeah. you can't you 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 lose all objectivity. You need, you need a different set of ears to come right. in. Right, and, and we were, and we all did that for each other. Awesome. Like you know, it, and it it was a little tough for me because I'm going with my you know the my bosses, 
that, I, right. that I'm kind of working sure. for now. But I'm also, in some cases, I have to produce. But they also know? have, obviously, they have mad respect for your skills to, they, to bring they, you into that situation. You know? They they didn't shut me down all the time. That's all. I'll yeah, say. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was it was. They let's put it this way. I am eternally grateful for what they let me do on this album for the opportunities they gave me. And I this album been, and I, this album sounds you know like just killer. I mean, it's well it's well clad. It's up there with anything else they've ever done. I think I appreciate yeah. that. Where it's it's doing very well. It's getting reviewed very well, and we're yeah. incredibly proud of it. And we you know it's. It's very difficult because I've never done a record like this. Usually, I'm the Napoleon of the record. I get to say everything that happens. I get to right. write all the songs. That's sure. just I've only done my own like independent stuff. Yeah. But now working with other people and for a major band on right. a label, you know what I mean? With where, a lot of expectations of right of, when from you the have bands. to hand yeah. songs off to Tom Lord Algae to mix. Tom Lord Algae, who is <laughs> yeah. one of my heroes, you know what I mean? It, 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 it was a totally different experience, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to get bulldozed on this. So, yeah. like, it'll be – I'll just be happy to sit in the corner and have one of my songs and maybe play a little <laughs> solo here or there. <laughs> yeah. But but they were just like, no, man, you got ideas? Go for it. Let's let's hear them. What do you and got? I think that the thing is, too, I mean, Richie, obviously, you know, you're very ex- experienced what you do. You're a great guitar player, you're a great writer. Thank um, you. But it's, it's good for them to bring in new blood and bring in – like you can hear that. Like you hear the you hear the past and you hear the future of the band in this record, which I think is just a, the perfect combination. That's in my opinion. I mean, we're we're thrilled with how it came out, and at the end of it, you know, when we all listened to it, and it was it wasn't easy. I mean, especially dealing like there would have been times where it would have been really nice to be in the room with everybody, sure, and, and do some of this stuff. But, but it's it's just sort of the new normal, as they say. You know, yeah, for now. exactly. But after like the 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 back and forth and and the debates about you know the the level of the hi hat and 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 all this <laughs> cra- sure. crazy stuff that you that you obsess over you know when it was done we were all able to sit back and go wow like this this came out we're really proud of this like we what's really- the um, what's which songs do you actually sing lead on so people can check it out on the record? I sing lead on Tainted Blood mm-hmm. I sing lead on um, the Machine and the Return of Saint Cecilia cool. All right, cool. So people can definitely check that. Out. Yeah, and they, like they should, they should check this record out because, like I said, I listened to the whole thing yesterday, and it's just it's really what I like about it. It has the classic feel of Blue Oyster Cult, but again, it has like a modern update, which feel, which feels authentic. I think. Yeah, that's... I mean, there are fan theories that I think are interesting. Uh, that each because there because there are fourteen songs on the album, right. and there have been fourteen studio records. That yeah. each song is doing a different record from yeah, the band's history, right. yep. uh, which is a cool theory. Um, I, I Well, think... they sort of all have to stand alone but in, as a group at the same time, right? That, which is tricky. You know what it is? Work. It's And I just thought about this. It's the... A lot of the band's other albums are amazing, but they're sort of like monolithic in the way they sound. Like, you know, like Secret Treaties has a very different sound than Fire of Unknown Origin. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's almost like it could be two different bands almost. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Which is good and tricky at the same yeah. time. Right? But, but but like you see like the bands w- where they're at at that right. point in time. Uh, so it's different. It's I can see why people would say that because we we kind of morph styles a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of variety in this album. But I think the reason that happened is because I am – the way my experience with the band is I've never – really like the, i experience the band as whatever the set list is you know what right. i mean like yeah. i'm i'm concerned with the songs i have to play so sure. to me um you know veteran of the psychic war and me 262 they're they come from the same thing even though they're years apart you know what sure. i mean and so but it's like oh no this is a boc song this is a boc song right it's, right it's so to me it's like oh i'm gonna do this like like for example, in the Return of Saint Cecilia, there's like this piano thing. I'm like, I'm gonna do the ME two sixty two thing here, which is mm. an an early thing, right? But then um on another song, I'll be like, Oh, I'm I'm gonna do this uh this synth thing that's a from from Fire Run on Origin from a right. veteran. You know what I mean? Or yep. I'll do it's or I'll do um So you're I'm, sort I'm of running, you're sort of cherry picking the best of the past. Right. I'm right. I'm cherry picking all the this the different uh things that I'm just familiar with from having to play these songs. Right. And I know that, I know that's how I was doing it, and I, don't, I know that um, you know Buck would have some songs like he has a song called "Train True," 
that almost could be it could be one of those early songs. Right. And then he has a song called Secret Road that sounds like a later song. Sure. So, you know, where we weren't afraid we, like there was no discussion saying like this album it must sound like this from beginning yeah. to end and anything that doesn't fit this mold is going to be rejected. It's, well, I mean the thing is too is as you go I mean it's been 20 years since their last record, 19 years. Um and you grow as a person, right? Mm-hmm. I mean Buck grows, Eric, you, I mean every, it's so you should actually it should bring yeah. a different influence. Yeah, and um, and and it's basically like there's a lot of different things in here, and if if you're you know what there's enough there's something for everybody. That's what I'll say. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I want to <laughs> um before we run out of time, I want to talk about Band Geek because oh yes, thank you. That's so that's your YouTube. I guess I guess you'd say YouTube Facebook Live series. Yeah. Um, and you have like almost seventy thousand subscribers on YouTube. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I love what you guys do. So you basically take tunes from all different eras, you Boston, Rush, whatever, and it's with a great group of players. Tell me how that sort of happened and, yeah, and the success was, of it. I was doing, I had a day job and uh, I was working for American Musical Supply, which is a great company, and yeah. I was doing uh, product demos for them. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was do- doing that nine to five and then doing Blue Oyster, the cult, job. Gigs. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Blue Oyster cult gigs on the weekend. Oh, okay, cool. And I was losing my mind. Yeah. And I thought the only the only cure for this was to do have a creative outlet and to just add more work to that. So <laughs> the only the only cure to my my exhaustion is more work. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. I I started Band Geek then because I I was like I, my soul was getting crushed, and I it started as a podcast. Because, you know, on my long commute to work, I would listen to podcasts. Right. And, you know, um, being an egomaniac, you go, I could do this. So, <laughs> yeah. So, By the way, it's not easy to do, yeah. <laughs> as you know. <laughs> so I just started doing it. And, yeah, you're right. It's a pain in the butt. And what we would do is, because we're musicians, like, I wanted it to be just like, you know, we're going to talk about geek stuff like comic books and movies. Um, but because we're musicians, like, we'd eventually, like, we'd have the instruments in our hands while we're talking sure. and we'd play stuff. Yeah. And people responded to the playing more than the talking. Yeah. And then we would, okay, well, someone take a video of us playing with the cell phone and then right. I'll just post that. And then we noticed the videos of the playing would have way more views than the yeah. talking. Sure. And then we and then we said, okay, well, let me get a couple more cameras down here and we'll make a nicer video. More views. And uh, it let me grows. get <laughs> let me let me put some lights down here and let me get some yeah. some stands and let me do you know, okay, more views. All right, let me paint the studio, let me put screens up. Yeah. It's like more views, more views. So the so more now you have like, a whole TV studio at your at your house. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> more the the more I went into uh that mode of just doing performance, you're just musicians playing, mm-hmm. the more, the, the better it was. Like, the, and, you're, and you're using players. I mean, they're obviously your friends, but you're using guys that are like world class players, world yeah, class singers. I'm, I'm very lucky uh, that I have access to all these people. Um, and it, it, it just started with my friends, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened is people started noticing and asking, hey, can I be on the show? And yeah. I'm like, you want to be on, you want to come to my basement? Staten Island and squeeze into this tiny area <laughs> and, and and play like some cover song with us. Okay, yeah. but you, you did. Um, you also did that, something that was viral was uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Yes. By yourself. Yeah, I did that. Um, that was before, but that was sort of that was after Rudy's uh, urging. You know what I mean? Oh, like okay. the first the first big project I did after Rudy kind of nudged me was I did this a similar thing with uh, ABC by the Jackson Five. Sure. Yeah. And then. Um, after there was a situation, you know the. Uh, actually, it's why I met you as well. Um, it's uh, do, you, do you know uh, the Queen Extravaganza with Mark Martell? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I yeah. So and just that. so people know, so, so people know who that is. So Mark Martell is actually a viral guy that does Freddie Mercury, and he actually did a lot of the um, voiceover singing and um, Bohemian Rhapsody, the, the, the film, right? Yeah, he, he's a dead ringer. Yeah, he's amazing. So check him out. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I was part of that like contest they had an online contest and they flew me out to uh and that was with roger and brian and yeah yeah just roger Roger was there but they flew us out to the foo fighters studio in uh in la and we got to audition and uh i you know it was amazing i got to meet roger taylor which is so cool and um i thought the audition went well but it apparently didn't go that well because i didn't get the gig (laughs) and um 
to commemorate that experience, I went home and I recorded Bohemian Rhapsody, right. you know, because I wanted to commemorate it. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and you did you did all the parts by yourself. Which yeah, is no, I, you know, no easy feat. Right. It's my favorite song, and uh, I sort of have been learning it since I'm 12, since Wayne Wayne's World came right. out. Exactly. You know, and I, I was just, I've been obsessed with that song since the first time I heard it in the movie theater with my dad, and I remember just hearing that song and looking over my dad, and I said. Which is what the that, hell is this? And that's a freaking hard song to play live. <laughs> yeah, because they never actually did it right. They never did the full song live. No, they came in on the rock section. Right. Yeah. So you know, I'd been learning it, and it took me about a week, and I had the motivation from the whole Queen Extravaganza experience uh, fueling me, and right. I basically locked myself in the basement, and over the course of a week and record this whole thing, I basically recorded it until I made myself physically ill. That's how I did it. I was, I remember at the end of it, I, I was laying A, a little in, obsessive. <laughs> I was sick in bed editing it on a laptop. Wow. Like this. Yeah. And then I remember, because I remember I posted, I think, uh, the day after Christmas and I was sick during it. And uh, yeah, and it was the first time I ever had a viral video. And I remember because the YouTube counter got stuck at 300. I wow. said, this can't be that I only have 300. It's a 300 plus. Back in the day, they would do that because they would oh. think you were a bot spamming. Interesting. And they yeah. had to verify all the views. Right. Um, and then it, you know, it it quickly w went up there. It was like in the hundreds of thousands soon. And then over a, a course of time, it got to a million. Wow. And now, now it's a little easier to get to a million. But I knew that, okay, I have this thing. I have to immediately put out something else after this. Right, you want to capitalize. Because like, yeah. like I've been given a gift, you exactly. know what I mean? And and you can squander the gift, uh, but I, I said I'm going to just immediately try to do, do that. So I did other videos like that, uh, and then the Band Geek thing was great because that gave me an excuse to keep doing stuff. So what, what's the uh, the future for Band Geek? Are you guys, uh, you have, you how do you actually do, do you plan tunes that you want to do? Is it like a group idea? Or what how, we, how does that what work? we usually do is um, we'll, We'll have like sometimes we'll like have like a text thread and and we'll have like twenty songs we want to do you right. know and we'll say that but most of the time it's if we have a musician come over because we have like rotating musicians yeah so yeah you sort have, of have now you sort of have a core group and then you rotate right over. right so if someone comes in and you have oh, I was just say Anne, as Anne Marie right yeah yeah, yeah. so like your or, singer yeah yeah singers. so I'll I'll say like um. Like I was listening to Boston in my car and I heard smoking and I heard right. the high A. I was like, you know what, Amory's gonna murder this song. Yeah. So I'm that's I'm always trying to think of like what song's good for someone. Like, right. I think was on the gig we played was Chris Clark on that gig. Oh, I don't remember. Hmm. Might have been. I think it, I think Chris Clark might have been on that gig. They were all but, killer singers. <laughs> yeah. No, Chris, Chris Clark is a keyboard player. Oh, keyboard player. Oh, okay. So, oh, maybe um, so. Yeah, actually, yeah, because that was yeah. a while ago. But yeah, maybe so. so. I met him and uh, he wanted to do something like a, a deep cut when he came over right and i said because he lives he lives not too far from me oh, so okay. uh cool i said i said no i said we we gotta do close to the edge yeah. i said Amory could sing it we can all play we just don't have a keyboard player she sings do the it. crap out of that song yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely i, I messaged said, like, you i'm like i'm like holy crap that's so good yeah and he was like i don't know that's like too on the nose i said no no let's do it yeah so we did close to the edge and john anderson saw it Oh. And invited us all down to a gig, and uh, wow. and, and me and Amory went backstage, and he hugged us and talked to us for about ten minutes about how much he loved the video. How cool! Yeah, and and I was my dad was with me, thank God, because I was a buffoon. I was like, "Nice <laughs> 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 <"Thank laughs> to meet you." <laughs> but that was me. I, I I was I turned into a complete idiot. Yeah, that's a legend. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's and there's a lot of nice things. Like we did um, we did a cover of. Of Hold On by um, Wilson Phillips, mm -hmm. and uh, China Phillips commented on it. Oh, awesome! At, at, yeah. at how much you loved it, and then we the video is fun too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we did a video of um, of To Be With You by Mr. Big, and Eric right. Martin saw it, and he was like, "I can't. I thought this was me for a second, and that you guys were lip syncing." How fun! Which is, which is high praise. Yeah, so, I just okay. actually just interviewed uh, Billy Sheehan. So oh, we cool. to, yeah. how good is he? Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> We, you know, it's basically like whoever the guest musician is, I try to say like, what can this person, what can we, what is this person going to absolutely murder? And All right, sure. The, the rule we have is like, I've done shows before where you do like a podcast or something and you play and then you leave and you go, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. Like right. I didn't play good or I didn't come off good. I, the first thing I say to people when they come here, I, I said, by the time you leave here today, we're going to have 
a song or two finished, and you're going to be happy. Yeah. I said, we'll see. Because you, you want them to be happy, right? Yeah. You want them to I showcase said, I, I, what they do. I want yeah. you not to regret this. I want you to just be really thrilled that you did this and share this with everybody. I said, right. we will sit, We will stay down here as long as it takes. If we have to do this song a hundred times, we will do it a hundred times. Yeah. And sometimes it takes, a hundred, not a hundred, but sometimes we have to do a song 20 times. Right. Yeah. Because you guys, are, a lot of the tunes you guys are doing are not easy songs. No. <laughs> and, and, and of course, as soon as we open the can of worms of like progressive rock, everybody like wants us to keep raising the bar on it. Like, right. Hey, you guys should do 2112 or YYZ. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the thing is like, you guys kill that stuff. It's so good. I mean, it's, it's we, freaking we awesome. love it. And the thing is me, Andy Ascalise, our drummer and Andy Graziano, who he and I switch off on guitar and bass. We had a band, the three of us. Right. And we really, we loved, you know, Emerson, like a Palmer, we loved, uh, yes. And we loved right. all the Genesis, yep. but like, we were always like missing the one element. Like we needed another keyboard player yeah. or we needed, you know, a singer who could sing really high. And we never really had that. And now because we're in the age of internet and collaboration and stuff like that, like, Hey, we want to do this song. Who can we get to do this one part? The one thing we can't do. Right. right? Yeah. Like if I say, Oh, I can't really sing this this song I want to do. Oh, let's get Mike Torelli to do it. Or let's yeah. get Constantine Maroulis to do it. Like now we can actually Yeah, Constantine's just, killer too. <laughs> yeah, we can actually, you know, like we've always wanted to do right now. Sure. But Amory's like, ah, it's not I, I could kind of do it, but that's kind of like a, a dude song. You right. know? And so we'd be like, okay, let's get this guy. Or, you know, let's let's get Cassim Sultan to sing this song. It's like we right. we've always, you know, now we we can sort of we we don't have to treat ourselves like a band saying we are th- th- just the six of us. Exactly. That's it. We can only do these songs. It's like no, right. I want to do this song. Let's call someone Let's who could do that out. and, and yeah. come down for the for for a night and fin- and we'll just do it. You know, that's it. <laughs> Awesome. So um, let's uh, just to wrap up, I want to make sure people can find you. So tell us how they can find, um, well, BOC, obviously, blueoystercult.com, I guess. Yes. That's yep. their website. You can find um, me there. You... you can find me at richiecastellano.com. Okay. And all my social media links are there. Pretty easy. Yep. I'm and, on uh, and then and... on YouTube, it's uh, just Band Geek, right? Well, it's I. there are two YouTube channels. I had to phase out the Band Geek one, but okay. uh, now it's mainly youtube.com slash richiecastellano. Okay, cool. But they can find the baggy stuff. And you oh, yeah, can all also the just, stuff, yeah. Yeah, and you can search on YouTube. Um, just type but, band uh, geek and we'll pop up. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, and I, man, I, I really encourage, I mean, first of all, again, the, the, the um, Blue Oyster Call album, The Symbol Remains, killer. Everybody should check that out. Um, and it's, 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 there's on Spotify. It's, just, it's kind of making its way around um, now. And um, also, obviously, Band Geek. Um, and I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, you, this I, was I, fun. Yeah. Well, I, I follow you what you do. And I, I think we're very similar. Like, I, I try to, we have to sort of reinvent ourselves all the time, especially in the current situation. Yeah. So, like, I, I think it's really awesome that your energy and your positivity is is very inspirational i think it's really Thanks. cool so i appreciate I, the human interaction too of talking to somebody i know yeah me too right <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much richie and uh for everybody um for for music matters we will um post all of richie's links on the podcast episode you can find us on spotify Podbean, soon on itunes and uh catch up with richie say hi follow what he does because it's, pre- it's pretty awesome stuff thank you so much richie thank you ciao bye <laughs>